always tough to follow Mike Butcher onto the stage, you know? <laughs> I won't make it clap, I promise. <laughs> um, welcome to the very first panel on the Extra Crunch stage. So we get to inaugurate this, and thanks for coming. We're here to discuss how to build a billion dollar SaaS company. And while there's obviously no magic formula for achieving this lofty goal, or everybody would be doing it, um, we're going to pick the brains of these distinguished panelists and learn some best practices and maybe some tips and tricks that you can carry with you as you kind of move forward towards that goal. So just to remind you what um, Mike just talked about, this is an interactive session. We don't want just me asking them questions. We would love to get questions from you, and you can do that through slido.com, hashtag disrupt SF, select the session, and submit your question. All right, let's get started. You guys ready? Yeah. Let's All right. So let's start with Neeraj. Um, you wrote a post for TechRanch five years ago, which actually was kind of the thesis for this panel to start with. You have updated that this week. I think it was maybe even published this morning. <laughs> and, um, and how to get the path to a billion dollars in revenue. So let's start with the, like, what's the target ARR to reach a billion dollars in revenue, get, sort of get you going to Yeah, today. sure. And, and Ron, if I can provide a little, just a little bit of background. You know, from my perspective, there's never been a better time to be a cloud uh, founder. You know, there's so many disruptive trends in digital and, and, and we're early in cloud adoption. And I think we're gonna see a lot of growth. Now, to get to a billion of ARR, it really depends on how fast you're growing. Um, you can easily do that. You know, if you're growing really fast, the gap is actually wide between a billion of ARR and actually a billion in revenue. You know, but I would say on the order of magnitude, you're probably talking about a billion two of ARR to get to a billion in revenue. So it's a, it's, you gotta, you gotta go up higher than... You gotta go up higher, yeah. yeah. There's a, gap, is a, gap is a trailing indicator, revenue is a trailing indicator in the health of a cloud business. So you've all been involved in SaaS companies at various stages of development, and you start to get that early revenue. How do you get from that early revenue and begin to build some momentum so you begin to get on that path? Do you, do you want to start? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I feel like the first thing, and we all talk about product market fit, um, which is also something you mentioned in the article, Neeraj, and it, you really do have to get that pull from the market to be able to really start the momentum and growth. Um, and I think we're going to talk a little bit later more about a freemium model, but I think that's one of the ways that we start to engage people in getting visibility into the product, getting exposure to the product, really getting people thinking about, um, and frankly, spreading the word about how this product can provide value. Uh, and so I think a lot of those early indicators and early traction are absolutely fundamental. You guys want to add? I, idea to early revenue, that's always, you know, as founders, you know, we realize that's one of the hardest thing to do, right? So when you have an idea, the, getting the, the zero to the, the first million dollars of revenue, and then we're talking about a billion dollars of revenue here, but a company won't get started if you can't get the first million of revenue. The first million of revenue is all about street fighting. It's product market fit, street fight, founders have to go out there and win business and do whatever it takes to, to get to revenue. And then, you know, the companies uh, start changing after that, you know, the second stage then becomes like still early revenue, the one to $10 million of revenue, which is a lot about like, you're still doing some street fight, but you're trying to build some sales ma machinery in place and your go-to market and, you know, how you generate demand that's coming in. You get to the next level, like, you know, let's say $10 million to $75 million of revenue. That's all about sales as a repeatable machinery. Right, so what you focus as a company changes, like zero to one, your goal is find the product market fit, do whatever it takes to get early customers. One to 10, start scaling it a bit, you know, uh, 10 to 75 is all about sales execution. 75 plus, the story changes to like, you know, how do you go in new markets and things like that. Right. right. And right. actually that first phase, that huh? one to 10, you don't even know what's repeatable yet. Yes. So right. you huh? can't scale anything. You just huh? have to yeah. try a whole bunch of things and as you said, sort of be scrappy and do whatever it takes. Yeah. So, so I, was, I was actually talking to a, a friend of mine who's a, who's a VC the other day, and he, he was talking about the, the illusion of product market fit. So he said, you know, like, you can, if you get good salespeople, you can get to $10 million just because they, they know a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But then if the product sucks, you know, it kind of all falls apart. Mm -hmm. So how do, you, how do you know as a founder that you didn't just hire good salespeople and that you, that you, yeah. you have a really lousy product? Well, <laughs> I, would, I would measure it by, are, are people successful with your product? 
the you know revenue is one measure of yeah. product market fit, but our customers adopting it and getting value out of it and renewing and until you start getting your first set of renewals and first set of expansions and like happy successful customers, you don't really have product market fit. So that's the only way you can know is right. the product really working or not. Right, because the customers will tell you, right? Absolutely, yeah. they'll yeah. tell you. I, I just chime in on that. You know, we on the venture side of the business. And by the way, when you refer, you refer to, I was talking to a VC. One of the few times I heard it in a positive context. Usually it's like <laughs> those VCs. You know, those are the negative context. This is Thank a you, guy. <laughs> so, um, what what we, you know, what what I tell my team to worry about is really being head faked when we're looking at new investments because that zero to two phase. Uh, you know, you're you're quite right. That's you know, if you have a good salesperson, they can usually sell something to somebody depending on what your expense base is. And so when we're talking to the market, what we're really looking for is the, the kind of a repeatable pattern of uh, use cases. So when we're talking to c c prospect A, prospect B, the words they use, the pain point they use is very similar from call to call to call. And once we see that pattern, okay, we know we got it. We can then, right. we can replicate that. But if you hear one thing from one customer, another from another customer, and like, oh, it's like, I bought it, but I'm not really using it, like, you know, then, then the red flag should go, like, hey, this, we're not yet at product market fit. Yeah, maybe it's that first revenue phase. We're talking about the hunt for repeatability. Yeah, repeatability yeah. of revenue, repeatability of use case. Oh. Um, but I also agree with what you were saying, that uh, Jyoti, that you know, it, it isn't just about revenue. Like mm -hmm. The measures of success at all phases have to right. somewhat morph. Mm -hmm. And you've got to be looking at usage, at adoption, value, renewals, expansion, mm -hmm. you know, and of course, the corollary churn mm -hmm. to give you good health indicators about how you're doing. Right. Um, sort of related to that, we have a, we have a question from the audience. Um, as you begin to scale up, what do you invest in? Um, hiring, promotion, something else? What do you guys think? Boy, I feel like that changes at each <laughs> phase, right? Yeah. It, it's every phase when you are, you are going through it, like, you know, you are, your, your, your goals become different. Right. Like, you know, initially you want, like, scrappy people who can wear multiple hats and get things done in any ways. At some stage, it's all about repeatability that you want people who can build a repeatable structured process around things. So you want that, but at the same time, you don't want completely everyone is like about, it's a, it's a machine or about everything. Like you still want the imagination and reinvention. Your startups don't scale until they reinvent themselves. Like every phase you have to start reinventing in many ways, like you know, what your product does and what use cases and the competitive landscape would be changing. So you gotta go through the reinvention. So if you lose the, so it's, it's all about the startup is all about you know hiring, growing people, and that's the hardest thing always. So. But I mean, just in terms of you know you're getting this chunk of money usually from an investor to kind of get you going, and as an early stage founder, you kind of have to start thinking about like where do I put my resources? How do I take this money and invest it in the best way? And if you're looking at that, like how do you kind of start to think about? you know, where to, where to put the money, you know? Yeah, Ron, I'll, I can chime in on that. So in this article we posted, you know, uh, several years ago, we called you know, the T2D3. We talked about triple, triple, double, double, double. So you started two million, then six, then 18. And in that two to six phase, there's two different paths for that. You can have a CEO founder typically sell the product, him or herself, right? Or start building a team and selling through the team. And what we find is most founders' instincts actually is to, to do what we call hero selling, where the person actually generates the sales from two to six. And what we find then is they then get, the next year they go from like six to 12. But to actually get from six to 18, you need to lay the foundation of, of uh, a sales team and a sales manager and reps who can kind of, who can repeat the magic of the founder. Right. And that's the investment that should happen at that early stage. Because the individual heroics doesn't scale. And so getting to some repeatable, scalable org model is really where I think the, the, the founders, typically their instincts is not to go there, but that's really where they should go and that's where they should invest. It seems like you know, the founders you know, obviously got the passion for the product, they created it, right? But how do you pass that passion on to that team that comes up in the second tier? I think that's a, that's a tough question. Well, now we're starting to talk really about culture. Yeah. And you know, how do you, well, I think two things, culture and vision. Right, so as you said, the founder often embodies that initial vision and some of the early employees are clearly a huge part of that. But I don't think you can ever take your eye off the ball 
of bringing that vision together in an articulatable way that people can really understand and, and really in internalize. I mean, we want every employee to feel like they're part of something meaningful and that they get excited and passionate about it because that's when they're going to do their best work. And so I think it's on the onus of the founder initially, but frankly, the leadership team that ultimately comes into play to really make sure that that vision is sound and well articulated, well formed, and is well understood by everybody. Um, and that's not a one-time exercise, by the way. That's a everyday exercise. Right. Um, and so I think that's a really important part that I think often gets overlooked, um, but needs discipline and investment. But it also gets harder as you get more employees, oh, right? Oh, yeah. A lot yeah. harder. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, how do you, you know, like, you, you can have an all hands with 20 people. It's easy, right? But when you have 300 people or 500 people or 1,000 people, it becomes much harder. It right? does get harder. And it also gets harder because it's so many new people. Right, like, you know, and you, you can't know everybody, right, yeah, personally. So it's like you have, say, you're going from 20 to 50, you have 30 people who are, like, you're more than, you know, half of your company is new, and every year it's, like, mostly like that, right? Exactly. And so now it's, like, how do you get the new people to embrace the same kind of culture and, like, you know, but uh, although at the same time also bring something new to the table as well. You don't want it to be completely, like, this is it, you can't bring anything new to the table, that's, right. that, that's not going to work also, right? You want people to bring. So how do you get that balance? That's, it's, it's very important. And it's very important for the CEOs and the management team to be very deliberate about it. That how do you articulate and line up, like, these are the things we care about as a company. So these are our goals and these are our vision, but these are how we want to do business. And, you know, many times people talk about, like, you know, culture evolves. Which is, which is true, but it does, I, also, I believe that you also have to be a bit deliberate about what kind of culture would you want. And at least write it up like, you know, we don't want these things to happen and like, this is not the place we want to be building. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a second time founder now, so it's a bit easier for me because I've seen <laughs> if you don't do it right the first time, you know, so it's like, I, I want to be more deliberate about these are the, this is the culture, and I don't want it to shape and evolve in weird ways I don't want it to be. Right. right, so that's, uh, you know, and I've that's seen like- That's a challenge, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that has, to, that has to trickle down all the way into yeah. your interview processes, right? You, you gotta make sure you're hiring people that one, can embody and embrace and enjoy the culture that you wanna create, but as you said, also bring something mm -hmm. additive to the culture as well. And Neera, you, you talked about having that in that article, the new article about bringing in that HR person yeah. really early. Yeah, yeah. just, to, just to chime in on that too. Um, in this new article that, that we published actually today, it's kind of a, a framework, um, we call it F to C, founder to CEO. Uh, it's the founder to CEO journey. And what we reference there is that if you look at companies that went public four years ago, you know, the IPO stage companies roughly had 130 million in revenue and about 800 employees at that point. Today, so the 2019 uh, IPO class, it was over 300 million in revenue and close to 1,500 employees. Interestingly, the time from founding to IPO is the same. It's about 11 years. So the takeaway I have from that is to say founders are now being asked to really run an organization of over 1,000 people when they go public. And, and so what does that mean? You know, many, many founders, our technical founders, haven't managed a, a person before. And so this is a, there's a lot of new things that are happening here. And so in, in the article, we lay out kind of five ideas to, to try to help with this journey. Because in the kind of the founder to CEO journey, what we talk about is you're a founder from starting, the, by starting the business, you're the founder. But you kind of need to, uh, you need to develop as a CEO. And what that really means is leading a team. And, and what's happening is you're now leading a team of 1,000 people. And so some of the ideas we talk about, one is to get a CEO mentor. Uh, and the second one we talk about is really hiring an HR leader earlier in the cycle. We mentioned roughly 100 employees as kind of a point. And, and the reason for that is, it's helpful for a founder to have someone who they can think of as an internal partner to build the executive team. Because if you get the executive team wrong, you can easily lose a year or two. And that many times, in my experience, is the difference between ending up first in a category and ending up second in a category. And unfortunately for all of us now, if you end up second in a category, you've basically wasted probably five to 10 years of your life. And as investors, we're kind of lucky to get our money back. It's a winner-take-all dynamic out there. And so what that means is you got to execute flawlessly, got to hire the right people, and this is really an HR game. And so developing those skills around leadership is really important for, for all founders. Yeah, um, 
you know, r related to that, we saw um, WeWork replace its CEO founder <laughs> last week, right? Yeah. Um, just before its IPO, and then the kind of IPO I, kind of I was collapsed. waiting for how long the WeWork comment was going to be worked in. <laughs> had to didn't work take long, in. did it? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, that, that, that's a good question, though. As early employees move into executive roles, they're not always prepared as the company grows into higher revenue phases to deal with those kinds of challenges. They're technical people. They have good ideas. They're good engineers, but they may not be, you know, good executives. It's a totally different set of skills. So when is it a good time to bring in that more experienced executive or executives to kind of help push the company to the next level? And that's something you've been brought in a couple of times to do. Yeah. So why don't you start? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I think that part of this speaks to the self-awareness of the founder um, or founders to know when they're in a little over their heads and when, frankly, they need additional outside help. Um, and certainly that was the case for me at Box um, when I joined back in 2011, where the company was really seeing a lot of pull and ex opportunity into the enterprise arena, but didn't have anybody on the team that really had a lot of experience building an enterprise business, and that, that's what I came in to do. And similarly at HelloSign with um, the founders who had great experience with product vision and technology development, but not a lot of go-to-market experience or company scale experience. And so I, I really give a lot of credit to the founders of those two companies for having recognized that, hey, we're at a point where we need somebody to bring in some of the skills that we don't have on the team and can help get us to the next level. Right. But then I think the onus is on the, the management team, the executive team as it's built to kind of constantly be looking at each of those phase points of, do we have the right team around the table to get us to where we're going next? Because what got us here won't necessarily get us there. And, and frankly, I think as executives, we also need to be self-aware enough to know like, okay, I'm like kind of at my limits here, maybe I should be thinking about something else. And I've had several experiences of that um, in many companies where either I and or the executive in play kind of had a conversation and said, hey, these are the expectations for this next phase from the investors, from our board, from you know, what we need to do to get to the next level and do we have what it takes? Um, right. Do you have what it takes? And, and, and that's often led to a management change and I think that's a very healthy thing to do. But it can be tough on the ego, I think, of the person who's being replaced. Of course it's tough on the ego. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, uh, yeah. but, but that's, you know. Yeah, but it, it's, it's, you know, at the same time, like, you know, you are building something, something important and something, like you have like hundreds and hundreds of employees who joined your mission to build something. Right. So if you're not bringing the right people to run things uh, at different stages, that's, uh, you know, uh, that can help you. That's, that, that would be, that would be hard. People, uh, but at the same time, like, you know, when the WeWork example now, right? <laughs> People start, the, the most stupid thing I find in Silicon Valley is that people start generalizing too much. Like, it, there was a time when, like, you know, at a, to go IPO, you need to bring professional CEOs. Even if the founder CEOs are doing extremely well, you have to do professional CEOs. Then people realize that that's, as a formula, that doesn't always work. Like, right. you know, a lot of great companies are, uh, didn't do that. Then people are like, okay, let's, let's, let's leave the founder CEOs, even though they're doing really crazy things like WeWork or like Travis at Uber, and <laughs> still leave them in place. That's also bad. Like, there's no one size fit formula to it, right? right. It's like, you, uh, you know, it's CEOs, uh, you know, founders or not, they have to do their job. And their job is like, you know, bring some things to the table, yeah. which is like, I look at it as their job is what? Like, it's, uh, they have to build, bring a vision to the, the company. They have to bring execution to the company. They have to bring, you know, I, I call it reinvention because, you know, it's the, you have to keep doing that. And that's where, like, a lot of times the, the, the product founder kind of CEOs uh, do well because they, they, are, they would be good. Normally, they're good at uh, that. And then you have to bring responsibility. Like, you are responsible. And you're not responsible to your shareholders, to your employees. You're doing right ethical things. So if you don't do those you know, it should be changed. Right. You know, if you, but if you are doing those, you should not be changed either, right? right so the it's like there's change, no one, right. size, one size fit formula. And that's sometimes people go like, right now the news cycle is all, you know, WeWork CEO was bad. He was bad, but doesn't mean every founder CEO is bad, right? So. Right. <laughs> Well, it goes back to what you said at the very beginning. If there was a formula for this thing, everybody would be doing it. Right, It'd be exactly. easy. <laughs> We'd bottle it and sell it. Yeah, All of us. Exactly. <laughs> um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, how that change happens, is how is that change generally driven? Is it the individual recognizing their limitations, which I kind of tend to doubt, or, but maybe sometimes that happens. Sometimes. Is it, is it a board level kind of decision that we need somebody who's going to kind of take us to the next level and we don't feel like this person is that person? Or is it, you know, an investor decision who might be sitting on the board as well? Uh, yep. All of the above plus. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just to chime in, I, I do think if you take a step back, so I've been, I've been investing now 20 years, you know, the, the power dynamic has shifted from investor to founders. 
right? Our bias is to invest in founders who can take it all the way. And, and we're, because there's so many product pivots that are required during this you know, 10 plus year journey, it's really helpful to have the instincts of the founder at, at the helm. But then in terms of running the company, bringing in executives, that person needs to do a good job and make sure that they're hiring the right executives, hopefully bringing them from within, but if that person can't cut it, they gotta bring in folks from the outside. So there's, there is this kind of general power shift from investor to founder. We're, we're comfortable backing founders to, to the exit, but I think Jyoti brings up a good point. If a founder is not being responsible, right. you know, we are fiduciaries at the end of the day to yeah. all common shareholders, including employees, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and we gotta do the right thing. And so investors have to step up at that point. Now, this whole concept of like voting thresholds and dual class structures, mm -hmm. you know, is, I think, terrible from corporate governance. They shouldn't, and founders, I, and when I talk to founders, like, you shouldn't want this, right? Because if you're not doing a great job, right, you're a shareholder as well, and things should change, right? There should be a mechanism to allow for uh, check and balance in the system, right? It's, we have it at all aspects, I mean, all institutions have that, right? And so that, I would that to me is the I would one, the I would one issue. I disagree with that. As a founder here, I would disagree with that. <laughs> well, it depends like, on who your extended yeah. team is, right? You know, I, I, would, I would say like, you know, the checks and balances have to be on the investors as well. You know, most of the times, you know, you are a smart investor, and, but most investors are not. That's the unfortunate reality. It's a low bar. Like, you know, it's a low bar. Uh, I, I'm winning on this one. <laughs> there, are, there are VCs who are like, you know, sometimes, when a, when a, when a company gets to a hundred million of revenue with thousand employees, yeah. Half of the VCs in your board have no idea what to do, yep. even less than you as a, as, as, a, as a founder, because they have never run a business at that scale in most of the yep. times, right? So now it's like, you know, if all the voting power goes to them, the company make bad decisions as well. Hmm. So how do you get the checks and balance, right? So when, like, you know, when a lot of founders uh, said, like, you know, we need to get the you know, the, the, the more voting power to founders to get that balance. Yep. It's, 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 it's the health, like, you know, you don't want the power, the, it to shift from like, you know, it's all, investors have all the power to founders have all the power. Mm -hmm. You want the, the right yeah. check and balance. But, but doesn't but an independent if, board help with that? If you have two or three independent board the, members? Well, the, the, the VCs will have all the preferred stock in the company with lots of voting rights around it. So, the, it's, it's, so that's, you, you don't want that, you know, it to flip on that side. Like there is so much power that the investors have with their preferred stock and voting that the founders really, the founders most of the times, by the time the companies get bigger, are, they're down to about you know, 10 or 12% of ownership in the companies. Right? That's what you look at, like a company gets to, uh, close to an IPO. Mm -hmm. That's where founder ownership normally comes down to. Yep. And if they don't, they, their stock doesn't have a special voting power, their, 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 their influence on like, you know, the key decisions become really lower. And that completely can damage the, the dynamic as well. So you want the balance. Yep. You don't want the, the pendulum to swing completely on one side or you know, either towards the founders or towards the investors. Mm -hmm. It's the healthy balance that is key. So I, you know, I would disagree with you on that. <laughs> so well, do, you, do you think founders should be able to block then? Would a founder, should a founder block exist? Because that, that's fundamentally what happened at WeWork. Well, uh, WeWork is at, you know, if founders are doing really crazy things, then there, there has to be accountability around it, mm -hmm. right? You cannot allow that in any circumstance. But at the same time, like, you know, founders are, like, you know, are not doing crazy things and delivering the right results. Yeah. So the WeWork example is not an example that should apply to, we have like, you know, think of like how many unicorns are there right now? One, 180 unicorns, yeah. right? Maybe 10 out of those, I have founders are doing crazy things. So let's not, gener should we generalize as, you know, to the other, other 170 as well? Mm -hmm. Not like, but let's. We should make sure that those ten uh, unicorns or founders are doing bad, crazy things like we work are hold accountable for. And investors should also hold them accountable when they're giving them money as well. Like which, where I do think SoftBank messed up in not creating accountability when they gave up so much money, uh, gave so much money to them. Well, I think yeah. we could take this to a tier of accountability, right? I mean, your question sort of stemmed from how did these changes happen and who instigates them? And, right. You know, I think we're talking about board dynamics and, and shareholder dynamics. And right. I think and there's... That's certainly what Jody's talking about there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there's, there's accountability, at, frankly, all levels of the organization. I, I mean, you have to instill that in people managers all the way up through the executive team, up through, you know, board members. And, and so I think these changes, yes, once in a while, somebody's self-aware enough to go, I don't know if I'm in the right job here, if I'm going to fail. Right. But I think more often than not, it's somewhere up the food chain that somebody's making that recognition. Right. And, and right. I think, you know, I certainly see it, the onus is on me to recognize that in the people that, that work on our management team. Um, and I think the onus is on the founders and on the board to be looking at that at all levels as well. So. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that, um, 
that kind of gets people going about that, that that very subject is is this spend, right? So you're spending at a high rate, say, and this is a question from the audience, actually, from Chaz, was that, you know, thoughts about being capital efficient versus going super fast with a higher burn rate. And the, the, the running theory is if you have a large market with available capital, then, you know, burning fast is not necessarily a bad thing if you believe that, you know, the, the company will grow large enough to find a accommodate that. And I know that with Box, you know, at the time their S1 came out, there was just a huge cue and cry about their burn rate. Yep. Um, so, uh, you know, what do you guys think about that? Like, is it, what is an acceptable burn rate, you know, and, and from the, you know, investor level, what are you thinking about when you start to see a high burn rate? Uh, do you want to start? Yeah, I can start. From, from the investor perspective, I, I think in every board meeting, basically, you know, at a high level, there's a spectrum between profitability and growth. And there's, in essence, you're, tr you're figuring out the right point in that spectrum to, to set for the company for the upcoming year. Uh, that is dependent on a bunch of things. It's dependent on you know, the market, the competitive landscape, and equally important is the capital market, right? If it's a frothy capital market, and if you can raise a whole lot of money and give up very little of your company, yes, you should probably lean in. But if it's a tough capital market and you're gonna give up a lot of your company for, for a little bit of money, you probably shouldn't lean in. And so. So this question is dependent on a lot of external factors. But I, I come back to the, uh, the thesis that, there, you know, whether we like it or not, it's kind of a winner-take-all environment we live in. You know, when I started in venture 20 years ago, if you invested in number three, you got your money back. If you invested in number two, you made decent money. You still made most of your money in number one. But now, if you invest in number three, you're losing money. If you invest in number two, you get your money back, maybe. Maybe make a little bit. But it's all about being number one. And so, if as a founder, if you can uh, invest in an initiative that maybe has a 10% chance of success, and it's a frothy capital market, and you increase the probability of being number one by, say, 2%, that's a trade that's worth doing. Like, rationally, that makes a lot of sense, right? Um, and so, I do think that this burn rate question is a tough one to answer in isolation, uh, but it all has to do with what the initiatives are that you can spend money against. And so. As an investor, though, you know, at the end of the day, we, we're playing to be number one in the category. And so you have to look at how well capitalized the other players are in that space as well. Yeah. I think the, the one thing I would add, though, is uh, the unit economics have to be profitable. Yeah. It's, it's not the, the company doesn't, the company can still be burning cash as long right. as the unit economics is right. So the, 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 the good thing about software businesses is that the unit economics is mostly well, very well understood. Like a SaaS software company, you know, that you will have about 70, 80% gross margins, you know, you will have, so the, it's, it's, it's a highly profitable unit economics to, to, to begin with, right? So, and now you're investing in growth and you're burning more, that is, totally, that is totally fine. Most companies would have to go and grab market share. The problem becomes when, the, when these are kind of new kind of companies like a WeWork or a Uber or a Lyft, like where the unit economics is not understood. And right. it's not clear that there is the fundamental unit economics profitable or not. Those are the ones where like burn becomes a big, uh, big, big challenge. Like, are they going to even survive? So the, the question for like enterprise software companies is a, is, is a bit different. Like it all becomes, because the unit economics is normally right. If they're doing something that's not right about unit economics, then, it's a, it's a, then investors should question and the market should question. And then the burn becomes a question of just a growth. Are you, are you funding growth more or not? And you know, are you hiring more salespeople, going into more geos, building more products, things like that? Right, right. right. And I'll add just one thought to that. I think yeah. the you use the word rational, um, Neeraj, and I, I, rationality is really at play here. I think there's uh, certainly examples we can all think of where people raise money and, and spent money like it was water um, without really an eye on unit economics or even a path toward healthy unit economics. And I think that's really where the downfall is. I, I think you can very healthily burn um, and, and deliberately do so. And at least certainly my experience in my most recent companies is do that, but with an eye toward a path back to cash flow break even and toward healthy unit economics. So if you're not in a completely healthy unit economic scenario, but you're doing it on purpose and you know why, and you know how to get back to where you want to go, right. that's okay. Yeah. Um, that's all goodness, especially if you're investing in a growth market. Yeah, and I, I mean, when I spoke to the uh, box CFO at the time, you know, that this was all going on. This is what he said to me. He said, you know, like, we, we understand we're spending a lot of money, but we're doing it with purpose. We did. Yeah. Absolutely, we yeah. did. Yeah. Um, 
So speaking of money, um, we've all heard about startups losing their way in the name of revenue, and we've been talking a lot about culture here, and culture is a path to growth. So how do you build an organization that emphasizes growth but not growth above you know, ethics and maintain that positive, inclusive, and ethical culture? I mean, for me, this comes back to that same question of culture and values that we started with, that um, clearly you want to set aspirational goals that really get people motivated and that there's that North Star that you want to go for. Um, but the way that you, I think you said this earlier, Jyoti, that the way that you do business, the way that you get from A to B is just as important as yep. the getting there. Mm -hmm. and, and you've got to instill in your people kind of a, look, this is how we're going to work together. This is the kind of business we want to be. This is the kind of company we want to be. Um, so I, I feel like it's really a combination of both and they should feed one another, not be distinct and orthogonal. Right. So, you know, if we're setting a really aspirational revenue target that's very aggressive, but we're telling people that we're going to do this in a collaborative, hands together, you know, let's go take the hill kind of way. Yeah. Um, that's a very different thing than just kind of, I don't know, talking about values. And that's, I think, where things get a little arise if you're not paying attention to the culture that supports the growth environment. Yeah. The culture becomes very important because if you look in the long term, that is really your only sustainable yeah. advantage. You know, it's because things change. Markets will change, competitors will change, you know, new technologies will come in, new trends will happen. But if you have the right culture, that becomes a sustainable advantage. If you look at a company like a Google or a Amazon, what's really so sustainable about them is a big part is their culture, that they have their, like, and they have all different elements of their culture that they've adopt, they've kind of evolved into their, whatever their culture is, right? Mm -hmm. But that's very, that gives them an advantage that, you know, they can go and, like, if you look at Amazon, their culture of going after new large markets and, and building products and, and starting to like win those markets. That's so culturally ingrained in how they operate. And, but that's their sustainable advantage in the long term. So that's why you have to, as a business, uh, you do have to focus on culture to win in the very long term. Yeah. So if you have aggressive goals, you know, um, how do you kind of maintain that kind of aggressive path to revenue while at the same time not like kind of unleashing your salespeople to do things that maybe in the, you know, in your worldview, you wouldn't want them doing, but you're still encouraging them to achieve these kinds of, you know, aggressive goals. So how do you kind of balance that? Like you're telling them, go out there and sell, 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 but, you know, don't do it in a way that's going to be questionable, you know? I don't know. I, don't, I feel like the go out there and just sell, sell, sell is a recipe for potential yeah. disaster. Right. I, I mean, it, in all of my experience in running sales organizations, I feel like the best selling strategy is be a great partner to your customer. Like, I mean, really try to understand what problem are they solving. I don't want to sell somebody something if it doesn't actually solve their problem. They're just going to, they're just going to not renew. So I'd much rather sell them something that we both recognize as a good fit and make them feel like, wow, I've got not only a solution to my problem, but I'm working with a great company that I want to do business with. I mean, that to me is a much better recipe for long-term customer sustainment and long-term expansion opportunity with customers. Yeah, and I mean, when you think about the subscription model, right? I mean, that's, yeah, you're you can't selling, just- You're you reselling just, all the time. Right, you, know? you can't just throw stuff at people no. because they won't renew, right? No, so aggressive doesn't have to mean treat poorly or, or take shortcuts or, you know, don't be thoughtful about the relationship you're building. And right. The, and as, as the, the, the leaders in the company have to set the tone, like personally have 100%. to set the tone. Because they, the first time a situation arises where a salesperson is saying, if we can win this deal, it's a large deal, you know, we can get a half a million dollar deal here. If we do these things, which let's say are, are say, not right or unethical or wrong or something that you would not want to do. Right. And as, 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 as leaders in the company, you said, yes, let's go ahead and do it. Then it will start the tone on it. It will start the pattern of like the next time that happens. And th for the fourth time that happens, they won't even ask you. They will just start doing it. People will right. start doing it. So you have to set the tone of like not allowing and not tolerating and creating the, that we're not gonna do that. Doesn't matter what the, the revenue there is. We, if it's wrong thing to do, we're not going to do it. And then it sets that tone as well that you're not going to tolerate that. Uh, so that's, that, it's, it's, it's a hard thing, but you have to like be very uh, deliberate about it to make it happen really. Well, it's probably that way with, with just the whole cultural aspect of, of you know, building a corporate culture, right? And being inclusive and, and uh, being ethical and having that kind of laid out for your employees, right? And I think sometimes these situations are not all that obvious. I, I'll give you a real example, actually. We had a, um, a potential customer, a very large potential customer, I think now about two years ago, 
um, at HelloSign, and of course we're in the business of doing electronic signature. Um, and this customer had a really unusual step in their process that was totally legitimate for their business, which was after the external party had signed the contract, they wanted to be able to make some changes to the contract afterwards. And it wasn't in the areas that affected the value. It, like I said, it had a legitimate business case in their world, yeah. but it prompted, I think there were eight of us in the room, five of us of the management team talking about, is this something we should do? And we ultimately came to the conclusion that it went totally against our principle of offering legally binding, legally defensible, right. completely reliable electronic signature. And, and so we went back to the customer and explained that. And they, and honestly, it was an awesome conversation. They were very, very grateful that we gave it the due diligence and thought that we did, completely appreciated our point of view. And they later became a customer for a different use case. Um, but I think they really valued they the fact that the we fact that said, back. we can't do that and here's why. Right. And, and they, got, they said, got it. So I, I think that's a good example of maybe not an unethical situation, but just a, like right on the line. Like, I don't know, this one's tough. Right, the, the ethics kind of, it yeah. pushes what you do, the boundaries yeah. of what you do, right? Um, you know, we only have about five minutes left. Is really it going already? by fast? Yeah. Um, wow. So it's, 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 it's not always going to be a smooth journey, right? You know, you're going you're gonna, to, I mean, it's nice if you get on that, that formula that you talked about, mm -hmm. but I mean, there are going to be times where growth stalls, right? And even a, even a good, solid startup can have bumps in the road. So what happens if the growth stalls? And how do you figure out what's going wrong and kind of get back on track? Well, I can give you, you know, from my perspective, when, when companies um, have issues, it's, it's usually hard to diagnose how much of it is a product market related issue. Right. And how much of it is an execution related issue? And um, usually it's a little bit of both. Um, and, and then kind of what you do to fix it, uh, you know, depends on that. Uh, so, if, you know, as an investor, I, I tend to kind of kind of want to form my own point of view on, on, on the situation. And if I believe in the product market space and then and if it's an execution issue, then we can help the founder to to kind of bring in kind of maybe uh, new execs that are capable of scaling at that level. Uh, and we've had several situations like that where we've had to rebuild a team kind of halfway through the journey. Uh, usually growth stalls for a couple of years during that time. Uh, it's a painful period. Yeah. But when, it, when you get it right, you come back out the other side and then you can reignite growth from that point. And it's, you know, you've lost a couple of years, but in the, in the grand scheme, you can still get to the, the promised land. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you can't get back. It depends on whether it's a product market issue, you know, right. fundamentally. And in many ways, like you know, so like even the even good startups can have some moments of it. Every startup has moments of it. Sure. Doesn't matter how good every they business are. from outside <laughs> it yeah. looks like oh this startup is going like completely like <laughs> is doing so well, but there is not in the inside. It's never like that. So you always have moments of that. You you want to ideally look at like you know you don't want to let it fester too long, like, you know, if something, so you want to, as a business, you want to look at early indicators of things. Yeah. Like, you know, is there, are you seeing too much competitive losses? That means, like, you know, your products uh, diff gaps or your products capabilities or pricing or whatnot is, is, is a challenge. Are you seeing, like, you know, lack of uh, demand or, like, you know, your salespeople are taking too long to build pipelines or the ramp periods are coming down, are, are increasing and things like that, right? That means that the demand is, has, has a challenge. Maybe you need to go and adjust and market and increase your addressable market. You know, and there will be like, you know, if the, if the quality of execution is, is, is many times the number, the number one challenge, like people are not being able to scale and things. So it's, it's hard to, but if you can look at early indicators and start kind of, you know, before it becomes a big problem, that even if it's a smaller problem, you can start acting on it, then that's, that helps the most. I yeah. think that's a huge testament for having key performance indicators well-defined early on, um, because it's only if you're kind of monitoring those on a regular basis do you start to see the anomalies that kind of say, hey, wait a second, something's changing, what is it? Yeah. And that gives you the wherewithal to kind of dig in. So I can't emphasize enough, I think there's no stage too early to have good, well-defined performance indicators. Yeah, that kind of ties into this, uh, this audience question, which is how you stay disciplined with finances and, you know, with your products as you move through that cycle from zero to a billion? How does, how does that, is it just KPIs? What, what else is it? Uh, well, definitely KPIs are an important part of it. But I, I also look at like, what, what are the goals to achieve in every stage? Like when you're in zero to one million goal, if you start looking at too many KPIs, <laughs> it won't really work, right? You know, it's, yeah. you really want to go and get your first 10, 15 customers, build the product that someone would, uh, someone would buy. 
and you know you try to figure that out and iterate. So like no KPIs really matter. The only KPI there is do you have paying customers <laughs> who are paying for it. That's it, right? When you start getting, going from one to ten, the KPIs start to change a little bit, right? You know, which is about uh, now you want to sell to more, you want to uh, validate more use cases, like repeatable use cases. Are you seeing repeatable use cases? Are you seeing customers getting success out of it? When you start to the next level, then when more KPIs come in, because now you're scaling. So like sales efficiency and demand generation and many more KPIs come in. But still, you don't want to obsess with probably the efficiency as the price. You want to track efficiency, but you don't want to obsess with efficiency. When you're going through that hyper growth of like super hyper growth, it's uh, efficient. It's, you, have to, you have to decide as a company what's important. Like, you know, is that hyper growth important or more efficiency? When you go to the next level, close to going public, like you know, maybe 200 million, 250 million efficiency does become important because you're, you go, you file for your S1, and everyone will be right. looking at uh, Everybody you know, knows how much, what how you're much doing. cash are you burning, <laughs> yeah, exactly. how much cash. Are, so you have to become as good in managing those KPI as well. So it, you have to almost evolve. Like you know, to me, I, I look at like what's what is the outcome of this phase of the company, and whatever it takes, we gotta go to that phase and focus mostly on that and not focus on things that are probably less important. I'm in the zero to one million phase. I really care about product market fit. I'm in the one to ten million phase. I care about like you know f figuring out, iterating on my sales process. I'm in ten to seventy-five million dollar phase. I, it's all about repeatable sales execution. Seventy-five million plus is about growing from like in you know, a broader set of products and things like that. Right. So you want to don't don't lose your eye on what is the goal. And then add KPIs to kind of uh, track towards the goal. The, the one thing I just added, I know we got to wrap, but to Jyoti's, Jyoti's point there, the, the problem that I often see is the founders have a hard time between 50 and 200 employees really moving from, from valuing individual contributors to building their team. And so embedded in everything Jyoti just said is really um, understanding that at the end of the day, it's, it is a team building exercise happening here. And they got to they, they gotta transition from being the founder to the CEO and building out those executives to help with, the, with all the things Jyoti just said. So I hope you guys you know, found this useful and you give these guys a hand because we're all set here. Thank you. Thanks guys. Thank you. It was great.